Hello, hello everyone. How how are you? I'm happy to be back for another episode of the Greatness Engineering Hour show. And today we're going to Canada and uh, a, a tiny, you know, a tiny region of Canada, Prince Edward Island, uh, the smallest uh, region actually today in Canada. And we're going to talk about uh, collaboration. My guest today is Patrick. Patrick, uh, Patrick, as you know, uh, he used to be a court, a courtroom lawyer, and he spent many years as a mediator, and he's now an author, and he's on a mission to change the world by creating a global culture of collaboration. And we got to talk about uh, this uh, six-step process that is developed, and and which is uh, you know the subject of his latest book. And we, we will obviously understand what are the key processes as far as, you know, leadership is concerned uh, when we, we talk about collaboration. And as usual, I want you let us know where you're watching from and get your pen, get your paper, because, you know, you're going to learn. At, you know, it's just like it, at each, you know, step of this episode, there's going to be something new. So make sure you have something to write on, something to write with. And, uh, and hopefully after, you know, the after this episode, you'll be able to implement some of the tools and strategies shared by, uh, by Patrick. So don't go anywhere. I'm going to bring him uh, here. And then please, you know, if you're watching live, don't hesitate to you know to 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 give your you know give your your point of view or ask question because this you know this show is for you and i really want you to be part of this conversation so don't go anywhere we are starting now Episode of the Greatness Engineering Hour Show, the show that is brought to you by the Virate Telekima Global Leadership Organization. What I feel is important is if you just look at the word compassion, when uh -huh. it's behavior, it's uh -huh. something that can be learned and it is something that we can embody through habits and through our daily actions. Like, what can I do now with the, this all experiences that, you know, that, 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 that I have? And for me, it's knowing who I am, believing in myself, and trust, and have confidence that yes, this has happened. To get this idea that if we interject this wisdom intentionally, mm -hmm. uh, it is, it, I call them needle movers, it's the needle mover that's missing. Good morning. Good morning, Patrick. Welcome to the Greatness Engineering Hour show. It's a pleasure to have you. 
and to have you back in another setting because you know we met on a coffee table virtual coffee table but now you know i'm so you know so excited to to get to uh, to spend an hour uh, with you but before we get to all the excitement i just want you to introduce yourself let us know uh let the audience know who you are and any key thing that we need to know about you Thank you. It's my pleasure to uh, to join you, and thank you for the invitation. So, a little bit about me: um, I grew up in rural Prince Edward Island, and uh, then went to uh, law school here in Canada in Halifax at Dalhousie. Then returned to my to my island paradise. Practiced law for 16 years as a trial lawyer. Uh, so that's about as far from collaborative as you could possibly get. <laughs> <laughs> then um, switched to mediation and spent uh, several years with a variety of departments in the federal government, across a few departments in the federal government, I guess, uh, in workplace conflict. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Through those experiences, um, really got to see things differently. I suppose when I went into mediation, I really did think that I had found the holy grail to, to how you solve things a lot quicker and more expediently than litigation. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that the really, people don't do that unless they absolutely have to. They only, they only use that model, which is in itself a collaborative model, only when all else has failed. Mm -hmm. And then I realized, wow, you know what? When they use mediation, four years down the road from when the problem first started, they don't do anything that they couldn't have done four years earlier. Mm -hmm. And and so that really became the, the, uh, the focus point for my book, The Collaborative Path, is changing the conversation at the start, not four years down the road. Mm -hmm. So that's really what I'm about. Now I'm, I'm retired. Uh, my this book and and the subsequent book that I'm working on, the Collaborator's Toolbox, uh, is really what I'm spending my time what I'm spending my time at. I have the the luxury of time, I suppose, and mm -hmm. to focus on on this. And and I think it is time that we don't just use the word collaborative; we actually be it. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. that opportunity presents itself. So that's really my mission. Yeah, I am on a on a mini mission here to change the world. I do want to see a global culture of collaboration. I'm mm -hmm. tired of seeing the scars of litigation and the uh, and the pain of mediation. It's not a fun process for anyone, and mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. could all be avoided. You can con you can prevent conflict be ever before it ever begins by changing the conversation from the debate style that we use now, what I've labeled adjudicative in the book, to a collaborative model. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you know, you know, what actually led you to really put all your focus, you know, I know you're coming from, uh, you know, a legal point of view as well as, you know, a mediator point of view, but why, you know, why now, you know, and not, uh, at a point where, you know, we, we, we really had, you know, a lot of conflict going on and a lot of, you know, uh, tension between countries or between people. So why now? It, this was a really interesting conversation I had with a boss. I was working in an area uh, in, a, in a federal department and there was some clashing between a couple of project groups. And so I, and so I said to my boss, I said, you know, I could, I could kind of bring them together and do a mini mediation, mini mm -hmm. conflict resolution process. She said, oh my God, we can't do that. The boss hates conflict. He'll mm -hmm. never buy into that. So I said, okay. How about we call it a mediation? Well, that's no better. How about we call it a joint problem solving process? She said, well, maybe. Mm -hmm. and I said, well, what if we call it a collaborative problem solving process? And she said, oh, he'll love that. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mireille, it was at that moment that I, that I realized 
that something that almost every mediator says as a truism isn't true at all. Mm -hmm. That there's a positive side to conflict, that it's okay to be good with conflict. That isn't, that just, that just isn't true. That's a grand illusion as, as I point out in one of the chapters of my book. We've all been taught, we've all drank the Kool-Aid that there's a positive side to conflict. Mm -hmm. And it really is an all's well that ends well argument. The idea is that because people eventually, even if it is four or five years down the road, end at a better solution than they could have or would have if they just continued their conversation um, and didn't get into the conflict and didn't use mediation at the end, then the conflict must have made it better. Mm -hmm. And and that really isn't true at all. There's nothing they couldn't have done four years earlier. Mm -hmm. And and so that's that really became, I think, when I shifted from the idea that's that I guess is when I realized that only people who are trained in conflict resolution are okay with conflict. And mm -hmm. that for everyone else, there is such a huge stigma attached to it that no one uses it except as a last resort. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and, that's, uh, and that's the shame because, you know, like you said, it's always a last resort when we, we, we don't have any option. Then we try to see, okay, what can we do that can benefit everybody instead of, you know, starting from, from that point of view. And it also, uh, because in, in the context as well, and, and, and I talk about, you know, when you work in a, in a corporation or even at school already, there's always this competitive, you know, culture and it doesn't actually nurture collaboration. So do, how do we break from that? Because that's really what we're carrying, you know, all the way from the education to uh, you know, the workplace and even, you know, more more in the social environment as, you know, a social agent. So how do we break and how do we get this awareness? That's that's a really good question. And that really is one of the one of the objectives of the book is mm -hmm. to break our dependence on what I've labeled as the adjudicative model. Mm -hmm. And so let's go back to the adjudicative model. What I mean by that is that really since probably the times of ancient Greece, when mm -hmm. we started to think about, well, to solve problems, you narrow the situation to a couple of options, and then you debate pros and cons. Mm -hmm. and, and you use an adversarial style, even if it's not adversarial. And I think that's really why I went away from it's a debate style conversation, uh, uh, which which debates are inherently adversarial, to a uh, to an adjudicative model. Mm -hmm. So to to the language of adjudicative. But what I mean by that is that it starts with a judgmental spirit. It starts with the idea. Every situation can be narrowed down to a couple of options, and one of them is right, and one of them is wrong. Mm -hmm. And so we've been we've got that so ingrained into our into our society that we don't just use that for decision making and problem solving anymore. We use that for everyday conversation, mm -hmm. and that's why we hear but. Yeah, but, and however, usually in the first three words in most exchanges going back and forth. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. so in order to get away from that, the first step in any growth, I suppose, is from ignorance to awareness. And mm -hmm. my book is really about starting that journey. You know, we're a long way from integration of a collaborative model into society until we recognize that that debate style or adjudicative model of of conversation um, until we realize that that underpins everything we do in society all of our everyday conversations then we're never going to switch so the first part is becoming aware that that's what we are using once we're aware then we can look at it and say does it serve us anymore and in that regard um 
how many issues, how many situations, let's not say issues, let's say situations, how many situations really break down into A or B? Not very many these days. More and more issues are so complex. Look at the fields of, uh, of expertise that have grown and how they're all interwoven. Look at the multidisciplinary practices in business, uh, multidisciplinary services where you can get change management and professional accounting and business strategy uh, and so on, all wrapped up in one organization that has various arms and various fields of expertise. And that's really what's grown up is, um, that's grown up in that way because almost everything is so much more complex than it used to be. And the, and the sphere of knowledge and information is far greater than it used to be. And the areas of expertise overlap and are interwoven a lot more than they used to be. So that kind of binary or dichotomous thinking where a situation can just be narrowed down to it's either A or B doesn't work anymore. It doesn't serve us well. Uh, and and I think that's uh, that's the struggle for a lot of people is that you know we're so used to uh, this binary uh, system that uh, you know we even when we lead even when we, we 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 talk to people we always you know have this focus on one binary yes or no or you know good or bad uh, positive or negative there's nothing in the middle. And as you said, you know, things are becoming, you know, more complex. Uh, people talk about the VUCA world now. So there's another type of leadership that needs to come now and another type of communication as well, which is, you know, um, one of, you know, one of the option is what you propose in your book. But I mean, in terms of processes, how do we go from this ignorant part to becoming aware and to now, you know, moving more toward a, you know a more collaborative way of leading and and communicating what i've tried to what i've tried to do in my book is to outline that this is a lot easier done than one might think mm -hmm. the, the 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 biggest problem really has been ignorance once mm -hmm. once you get to awareness okay that debate style isn't working for us anymore Adopting a simple six-step model is actually very easy. Mm -hmm. the, the neat part of this is that there are only six th steps to it, and each step only has one ball that you need to keep your eye on. So mm -hmm. that does make it easy to learn and easy to use. And the other piece about the model that I present in the Collaborative Path is that it doesn't require an expert mm -hmm. in, order to, in order to use it. It is designed to be user friendly. So, I think that's that's really the um, that's really the key to it is being able to capture it and express it in a conversational way that is, in fact, easy to learn and easy to use. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and it's amazing when you say you know it's it's easy because what's easy it's always you know what we're trying to complicate most of the time so it's uh, it's so funny that you're talking about you know easy steps which is not always you know how we see it we tend to try to get to the compli uh, complicated path instead of you know just following those steps that are you know uh, obvious to us so let's have let's have a short break and we'll we'll be back uh, you know in this uh, insightful conversation and know a little bit more uh, delve a little bit more on, you know, collaboration and, you know, the collaboration path that you're proposing in your book. Perfect. Join former White House chef Marty Mangiello as he brings to life colorful stories about America's presidents and first families that have occupied 1600 Pennsylvania well, Avenue Northwest. Is when screaming guests are lit on fire inside the White House. So I know that everyone's thinking like, what did he just say? It's time to be informed and entertained with Inside the President's Cabinet. Visit the website today at www.insidethepresidentscabinet.com.
So we are back. We are back with Patrick and we are talking today about collaboration and he is, uh, you know, focusing on the collaboration path that is has designed and, you know, put together in its, in, in its latest book. So, I mean, Patrick, you know, you, we've talked about, you know, uh, going from ignorance to awareness and getting this awareness to the collaboration. And as you see, we are in, you know, in this uh, very challenging period where, you know, uh, leadership is, uh, is uh, you know, is, is quite a challenge for a lot of people. So how do you think, you know, the collaborative path can help, you know, us to go to the next level as far as, you know, uh, things are concerned here? Okay, let me, let me start with three conversations that are absolutely killing the workplace right now. And I don't mm -hmm. like the word kill. And they are. So um, a study across nine industrialized nations indicates that in the typical workplace, every employee wastes 2.5 hours per week. So mm -hmm. 2.5 hours per week per employee unproductively because of conflict or tension in the workplace. Huge productivity factor, quite apart from the huge human toil factor. It's, it's, it's really, really draining on people. What are the conversations that feed that loss? Three, the big three conversations that are draining the workplace are the, I call them the bottle, the blurt and the blab. So let's start with the bottle. So in the bottle conversation, Paul is upset with Kate in the office about something. She does something and she's just got some annoying habit that ticks him off. And instead of addressing it with her, he says, well, maybe if I handle it better, it, uh, she, won't, she won't be like that. Or maybe that's just the way Kate is and there's nothing I can do. Or, you know, if it happens again, I'll address it. I'm going to let it go for now. So instead of having a conversation with Kate about something that isn't working for him, he just bottles it up in his head. And that's the only place that conversation ever happens. That's the first conversation, the one of avoidance. So after the bottle has been going on for a while, the pressure starts to build. And Kate might do something that is hmm, innocuous by any other standard and Paul blows up, the bottle explodes and he blurts out something that is sarcastic, mean-spirited um, or angry and those conversations never end well. That also feeds that 2.5 hours per employee per week waste. And the third conversation, and it's really the most dangerous of all, the most insidious of all of the conversations, is the blab. So Paul, after the blurt, he doesn't, um, still doesn't have the conversation with Kate. He goes and sees Sarah, who's his colleague down the hall, and he says, oh, have you ever worked with Kate? Oh my God. Have you ever noticed that she's like this? And what that conversation does is it starts camp building and it poisons Sarah's mind against Kate. So the next time that Kate and Sarah happen to see each other and Kate exhibits anything of what Paul was complaining about, what does Sarah say? Oh, wow. She is just like Paul said she was. And so that conversation, the blab conversation, conveys two messages, and Paul never uses any words to actually say these. First message, 
if you're my friend and I just confided in, in you and I'm ticked at her, you should be ticked at her. And the second, if she did this to me, you watch out because that's what she's like and she will do it to you. And it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So there's three conversations, the big three, the bottle, blurt, and the blab that are absolutely draining offices, workplace morale, and so on. And when you describe those to people, when I've described those to people in workshops, people easily associate with this, like, okay, yes. And they have like pictures in their head of people's faces for who's associated with each type of conflict. They're incredibly common. We all know they exist. They are all fueled by that debate style conversation in the first place and the avoidance of conflict. That whole idea, you know, and I talked about earlier, that whole idea that there's supposed to be a positive side to conflict. Anybody who's involved in the bottle of blurt and the blab definitely aren't seeing a positive side to conflict. So those are the three conversations. How do we shift? How do we go once we become awareness, well, aware that that debate style doesn't work? How do we shift those conversations? We do so by embedding the six step model into everyday conversation. And what I've taught in workshops is that you can have a five minute conversation, a 10 minute conversation to address when something isn't working for you in a way that engages the other person collaboratively with you to find a better way that will work for both of you. And how you do that is I've designed, I've designed a model, a collaborative message, a C message that embodies the six step model within it and it can be used in five minutes. So that's really, um, that's really, I think, where we start is we do need to change the conversation in order to change the culture. And, and that's where we, that's how we move forward. Um, so with that, you probably want to know, so, okay, so where's the six steps six and how steps. do they work? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. You, you anticipated my question, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> So here's the six, let's walk through the six steps then and demonstrate the, the logic that's inherent within it and why it works so well. And then we'll come back to how do we do that in a conversation? Mm -hmm. So the very first thing you do in the collaborative model is you set the parameters for the conversation. That is, you talk about how you're gonna talk about what you're gonna talk about before you get into the subject matter. Why we do that? We do that because the research of Dr. Gottman and the Gottman Institute in New York indicates that when conversations start well, they end well. And from his study over decades of the of couples having conversations in in that uh, stable relationship uh, called marriage, that the when they have those conversations, the ones that end successfully are the ones that take the time to talk about how they're going to talk about what they're going to talk about before they get into the subject matter. So that's what the set parameter stage does. Step does is it creates an atmosphere that disarms defensiveness and creates an atmosphere of safety for the conversation to happen. Then the next step is to then exchange perspectives. And so that's about each person hearing and being heard about how they see the situation and how they're being impacted. So with Paul and Kate, it would be Paul saying, when this happens, uh, this, this isn't working for me and, and here's how I'm being impacted. And Kate explaining in the same way from her perspective, why, how she sees that situation and, and what, what she was trying to accomplish. So from that exchange of perspectives, then what they do is define the issue or describe the issue in a way that doesn't attach fault to either person and describes it neutrally and non-judgmentally. So um, when they do that, 
that descri description of the issue gives them both space to talk about what's important to them. From there, they move to um, step four, which is to identify the interests at play. And this is a piece that is so dramatically different than the debate model. Remember in the debate style model, we started with narrowing the situation to two options. We never thought about what is it that we want and what do we want to avoid before we ever talked about options. We generated options and then we argued pros and cons. So in this model, we're gonna stop and we're gonna, okay, what is it that we want and what do we want to avoid? When we know what we want and what we want to avoid, a couple of things are going to happen. The most important of those is that there's a growth in mutual understanding that happens at step four. There's a growth in mutual understanding because when people describe what it is they want and what they want to avoid, those elements tend to have a level of compatibility to them. Just because of, of how we are as humans, our, our common humanity tends to connect us on those kinds of things. And they won't be exact, they will be similar though, and compatible. And when people start to see that, even though someone is doing something that isn't working for them, that what they want and what they want to avoid are similar to what are compatible with what I want and what I want to avoid, then, um, then a renewed mutual understanding happens, grows a little bit. From there, now they're ready to decide, or not to decide, but rather to, to discuss what could we do differently that would, that would help us to get us what we want and help us to avoid what we want to avoid. And remember when we were on the uh, Coffee with Rhonda show, one of the things that Rhonda uh, observed at the end was, wow, generating options is at step five. That is so different than our typical decision-making and conversations where we jump to the first two options at step one. So we, when we know what we want and what we want to avoid, then we can generate options that will enable us to get those things. Um, and then, and I'll come back to a couple of pieces about how we do that effectively. When we know what our options are, then we can test them and we can go to step six, which is to select solutions. When we go to select solutions, what we're really doing is saying, from the ideas that we generated at step five, which of those or what combination of those best give us what we described as what we want and what to want, wanted to avoid in step four, to address the issue that we described in step three. And so the logic of the process ends up being that you really do get, you get what you want and it works for you because it meets what you want and what you wanted to avoid. And it happens to work for the other person. You're agreeing to it because it works for you. They're agreeing to it because it works for them. And neither of you have to worry so much about follow through because you're each doing it for your own motivation. And so then at step six, when you're doing that, um, you're going to, um, you're going to be able to reality test them to make sure that you don't do something, drop a ball accidentally that, uh, and we all drop balls accidentally that doesn't derail the progress that you've made. So then you can talk about who's gonna do what and when and how and who else might be involved in those kinds of things, that whole devil's in the details piece. So that's the logic of it. So you start out, you set the parameters, you exchange your perspectives about how the situation is unfolding and how you're being impacted. Then you describe the issue in a way that is non-judgmental and doesn't attach fault to either person. 
Then you explore those perspectives to identify the interests that are involved, that is what you want and what you want to avoid. Then you generate options to get you what you want and what you want to avoid. And then you select the best of those using the wants and wants to avoid as the criteria for which ones are best. And and that's uh, that, that's uh, like you said that's a simple process. And and what I don't understand, you know, what 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 is really um, funny for me because I do a lot of you know project management. This is the the type of process that we go through for a project. And I don't understand why we don't do that when we you know we're talking about communicating and leading people, which is very funny, isn't it? To 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 see that we start. We do it the other way around than when we, we, we do project management where we start from, you know, uh, a, a number of ideas and, you know, putting the interest and where we want to be and then start to generate option and then get to the solution or to the what we're going to be implementing. And that's uh, that's just funny to see, uh, you know, uh, how, how, it, how it's, you know, going over where around when it comes back to you know us you human being interacting with each other so that's uh, that's a, a funny funny side of thing so how do you see it working because you know it's one thing to to have it there uh, but as part of the implementation on your side uh, how how do people respond to it because it's a big change for a lot of leaders and a, a lot of people uh, or the people working in teams or people who have a different, still this, you know, domestication that, you know, we have to go into the debate, use the debate style. So how do you, what are the key challenges that you've, you've encountered, if any? In the, in the workshops that, um, I've, that I've delivered about it, one of the, one of the things that I, did differently, I think, from most workshops, is I designed the evaluation not about whether or not the room was warm and bright enough, not about whether or not the facilitator was entertaining and funny. Mm -hmm. What I really wanted to know is, 30 days after the workshop, what did you use? Mm -hmm. And the second question that I asked was, did it have a positive impact or did it have a negative impact? And I provided them with a range of choices about how they about how they answered. And it could be things from I didn't use a darn thing to mm -hmm. I used all of it. And and then in the impact, it it went from it made matters worse to, you know, it it in it. it it improved communication, it improved problem solving, we're more efficient, there's far less tension in the office. So <clears throat> it gave the whole gamut. And what people were indicating, and perhaps it's a self-fulfilling prophecy because you mm -hmm. ask people or they know they're gonna be asked in 30 days what I used or not, I don't know about that. And I guess mm -hmm. it perhaps it doesn't matter if it is or isn't. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the fact is, is that more than 80% of people used a good chunk of the skills with a noticeably positive impact mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, from the proxy things that, that we had given them to, uh, to identify from. And so I, I don't think there is a challenge in implementing it mm -hmm. so much as it's a challenge just to get away, just to create that awareness that it that it that the debate style isn't working. That is a huge challenge. Mm -hmm. Once people start to use it, it's really easy. And in fact, um, one of the things that people will do after the workshop is uh, they would they would kind of mock it. You know, they'd be making like they would be going. So what I am hearing you're saying is so they would be taking a bits and pieces and experimenting with it. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, the, and initially like some managers would say like, should I be worried about that? Like that they're not taking it seriously. And mm -hmm. I was like, no, 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 that's a really good sign. They've mm -hmm. moved from 
ignorance to awareness. Now they're gone from awareness to experimentation. Mm -hmm. And they're making it okay to play with in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And so that was in the, that's what you would see in the first couple of days. And then as a couple of weeks started to move on, then people would start to use the skills on a more regular basis. And mm -hmm. then we would get uh, feedback sheets and comments that would be talking about, wow, this has made such a difference. Or I've used this more at home than I have in the workplace. And it still made a big difference in how I am at work every day. Mm -hmm. So, cause really we have, we have, we have tension with mm -hmm. everyone from our parents to our partners, to our pets. <laughs> Somebody mm -hmm. is always standing on our last nerve. Mm -hmm. And we're, we work through it by communicating. And so what I've done in, uh, in the, what, the, what we've done in that workshop is taken that six-step model that holds together with, uh, with logic and implemented it into very quick conversation tools. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, do, do you think that culture plays a role? Because obviously, you know, in different parts of the world, people communicate differently and there are some cultural aspects that are rigid in some areas. So how do you think culture play in, in all of this? That's interesting. I was reading, uh, I was reading uh, uh, Max, uh, Malcolm Gladwell's uh, Outliers, mm -hmm. and he was talking about uh, the impact of culture on um, the communications and conversations between airline pilots mm -hmm. and, and how that could impact crashes. And th there, there has to be some level of impact of different cultures upon this type of communication. Mm -hmm. There has to be some. And do I know exactly how that works out? No, I, d I really don't. Mm -hmm. And I think that a variety of cultures will have to uh, will have to experiment with it to a certain extent, perhaps to ab to absorb it and to really uh, be able to get a full handle on it. What I mm -hmm. do know, though, Mireille, is that we share one common humanity, mm -hmm. and and when we come down to what we want and what we want to avoid, no matter what culture we're in, we all have things that we want and want to avoid. And there's some level of compatibility among those because mm -hmm. we are one common humanity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so while I think that there has to be some cultural impact, mm -hmm. I don't think it is a showstopper by any stretch of the imagination. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We we have actually Shirley here. She's yes. been commenting on the, a lot of uh, so she's you know appreciate the model, but she's also saying that you know culture absolutely plays a role, and it also depends on the context and and that's you know that's really what I wanted to to get is that you know uh, is it you know the, yes the model is there but it might have to change given you know the culture change or being refined, uh, you know, uh, it, it, depending on the culture and the culture that, you know, where we, we are and also the context of, you know, the, um, so what do you think, especially the context? Because for example, if you work in the military and, you know, the communication is different from, you know, working in uh, artistic, you know, in the, in the art industry. So how do you, you know, uh, translate this model from what you have from the artistic, you know, area to a very rigid culture, which is the military, for example. That interesting that uh, those are kind of like really do sound like two extremes, don't they? Two polar mm -hmm, ends. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think, uh, let me start by saying that I think that in adapting the model to cultures, it will be about nuancing the language used to communicate the steps. Mm -hmm. The logic of the steps does not change. Okay. 
And whether you're an artist or a general, you have things that you want and you want to avoid and you want to avoid. And mm -hmm. those who are in that with you are going to be somewhat uh, somewhat uh, similar and compatible one would ex one would expect. Mm -hmm. The other part, I was reading um, uh, a book, uh, oh my God, Chris Patton and a group of them, John Hordizer from, uh, from Eureka Europe, um, mm -hmm. it, a purposeful people, I think it is. And many mm -hmm. of the stories in that were about, had, 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 come from people about uh, military backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I was really struck by was the extent to which uh, the military culture, which from the outside looks very much like command and control, order mm -hmm. and obey, has a high level of collaborative uh, communication built within it because mm -hmm everybody depends upon everyone else to, to such a great extent. Everyone's survival depends upon everyone else, everyone else's survival. And mm -hmm. so they, they actually have a, yeah, when you get into um, execution mm -hmm. in the military, from what I'm, from what I could gather from the stories, from what I've had from other conversations with others is that the military is, in in its actions, a lot more collaborative than it appears on the surface. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, the military certainly has its own language, and I, yeah, they would use terms, terminology. I think uh, the lexicon for implementing the model would change depending upon mm -hmm. what the culture is. The logic of the st six steps and its simplicity doesn't change. And it can mm -hmm. be used with anybody's lexicon, I think, in that regard. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, so that's uh, interesting, you know, and uh, Shirley, again, very educative conversation. Yes, we're learning a lot, Shirley. It's, uh, it's, it's different from what we're used to. And it's always good, like, you know, like Patrick was saying, to go from, you know, ignorance to awareness and know that there are alternatives that works, you know, as far as collaboration is concerned. So let's have our last break, and we will be back again to finish this uh, amazing conversation with, uh, with Patrick.
Okay, so we are back for the last part of, you know, of the show. And uh, one question that I always want to ask, you know, is, uh, you know, doing all this work, obviously, uh, you know, you're retired, you had, you know, a long uh, a very long career in the mediation lawyer. So what is really the, you know, the the legacy that you're working toward that you really want to leave, you know, doing all this work? What I'd really like to see is that we do shift away from the adjudicative model, mm -hmm. that debate style, to a collaborative model as the default. I, I make the point in the book that it isn't a one size fits all and we won't prevent all conflict. We won't prevent all tension. We will prevent a great deal and we will be far more effective and efficient if we switch to the collaborative model. And just like now, People use that adjudicative model and they litigate, you know, they get into courtroom battles and other kinds of battles. And then eventually when that all fails, then they will try a collaborative approach like mediation. So both models kind of exist now. The problem is, is that we have them backwards. We have, we use the collaborative only when all else has failed, only when the adjudicative model produces harsh results. And so what I want to do is to switch the order where we would use the collaborative model as our default and we would have the adjudicative model for those few situations and they are very few that truly require it. So that's really the, uh, that's really the idea. I mean, this really starts, right, the whole field of conflict resolution started from the work of the Harvard Negotiation Project. And, and unfortunately, it did get tied to conflict fairly easily, and conflict was thought to be a growth industry. Conflict isn't a growth industry. There isn't anyone who likes conflict. I haven't seen anyone who didn't say, yeah, I, I'd like to strengthen my collaborative uh, skills and capacities. So that's where I want to get to is that people communicate differently. I want to change the community, change the conversation around the world. And, and Mireille, like that applies not just for the everyday conversations. It applies for the innovative processes that have been introduced in the workplace, lean, agile. It applies to uh, international negotiations like people look at and they go well uh countries negotiate treaties well actually humans negotiate treaties <laughs> individuals negotiate treaties imagine the impact even when uh when the uh when the group from one country uh, meets with the other and says we're here to see if we can work out a collaborative solution as opposed to we're here to negotiate. When people here negotiate, they think, well, I gotta be giving up something. In collaborate, it's about how can we both succeed here? It's an entirely different thing. The conversations that I mentioned there with agile and lean, you try to use those processes, what do they depend upon? The human conversations among the participants on the group and the team. and so if those are still happening in a debate style, then you're still going to have the bottle, the blurt and the blab appearing in your scrums and so on. And all, all human progress depends upon conversation. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's what we need to understand. All human progress depend on you know the conversation that we're having. And if you know the conversation are not good, then you know the the result that we're going to produce on the ground is not going to be is not going to be great. So we really need to put a lot of emphasis on that. And it's becoming complex because now we have you know we have to communicate digitally as well, which is another. Uh, you know, another level of, you know, and, and 
just before we leave, just wanted to know how you think, you know, the digital conversation is, you know, is included in all of this. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's interesting. I, it's timely that you ask that. Over mm -hmm. the past couple of weeks, I've been working on an article uh, and I submitted it actually to um, the uh, Harvard Business Review last night. Um, and it's about that very thing. Mm -hmm. What we're seeing in the workplace, the virtual world, is tension really rising. The workplace mm -hmm. temperatures are escalating in this virtual interaction that we have. Mm -hmm. Why is that? That's happening because the debate style conversation is inherently all problem solving focused. It's mm -hmm. all task oriented. There's a zero relationship component virtually to those conversations. Mm -hmm. So when we were in uh, physical offices, and we had lots of socialization, interaction, face-to-face -face time. Mm -hmm. We had a human relationship element with our colleagues, which tempered the task-focused nature of the debate-style conversations. Mm -hmm. So we'd see them in the lunchroom, we'd see them at the, at the coffee, we'd go out for dinners and all of that kind of stuff. So we would, we would be connected with them. When you take all of that away, what are you left with? Just the harsh, cold reality of task-oriented um, virtual communication. Mm -hmm. And so in the absence of any relationship uh, component, then then you really have the weaknesses of the debate style conversation becoming full blown with no mitigation, no tempering uh, impacts at all from uh, from direct contact. So what we need to do is we need to we need to shift away from mm -hmm. that model. And COVID really is exposing the weaknesses of that model uh, to a greater extent than we've ever seen them in the traditional workplace. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Fantastic. So it has been, you know, we can we can stay here for, you know, <laughs> hours, but unfortunately, we're already, you know, we're getting close to the hour and it has been a very insightful conversation. And I urge, you know, whoever is watching, so Shirley and any anybody who's going to watch the replay, the recording, please, you know, make sure you uh, get familiar with with uh, Patrick's work and don't hesitate to connect with him uh, if you want to continue the conversation. So that's, you know, lead me to ask you, Patrick, how do people connect with you if they really want to know a little bit more, more have more insight or even participate to some of your workshop, uh, you know, on the collaborative path and, and your the process that you're proposing for collaboration. A couple of easy places, um, my website, collaborativepath.ca mm -hmm. is one. Um, the other, uh, LinkedIn is my platform of choice uh, mm -hmm. in thought leadership. I think it's a wonderful platform and I'm always on there and always open to invitations and conversations. I love the thought exchange on there and um, mm -hmm. all of, I'm, I'm continually generating uh, short video clips on my YouTube channel. Uh, mm -hmm. It's called Collaborative Paths. So it's plural, paths plural. Mm -hmm. And that's that's a really good starting spot. And then from from there, when people get uh, familiar with the uh, with the content and the model, what I've done is a series of clips that illustrate the model and how to use it and continue to do those kinds of things. As people get uh, more familiar with that, sure, they're uh, they're more than welcome to uh, pick up a copy mm -hmm. of the book, try to get that out of the glare. Mm -hmm. um, Let me just there we go. <laughs> and um, and then from there, uh, yeah, reach out to me uh, via email, Patrick at CollaborativePath.ca. More than happy to engage in a conversation um, about about this topic. 
Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And, uh, you know, and we recognize that it's a topic, you know, of, uh, of the time. Uh, people even say that collaboration is the new currency. So we really need to pay attention to this collaborative, you know, model that we're using uh, with other people, especially in the workplace, but also in our social, you know, interaction with our family, you know, with our friends and uh, people that we see as enemies as well to really, you know, find a way to <laughs> find a, a win-win situation if I can express myself that way. Mm -hmm. So any last message before we, we, we close the day or we are done for today? No, not on my end. Thank you very much, uh, Mireille. It's been a pleasure to uh, to be a, your guest on uh, on your podcast. Thank you so much for taking the time to share, you know, your knowledge and your work. Uh, and to the to the audience, please, as I said, I hope you know uh, you are you you'll be taking notes or you are taking notes, and you're gonna use those notes to at least implement. Uh, some of the, you know, some of the knowledge and some of the tools shares and strategy shares today by Patrick and make sure you connect with him if you have any question. If you can directly connect with him, you can let me know and I will connect you, Patrick. So not a problem. Thanks again, Patrick. Have a great day and thank you for uh, all the knowledge shared today. My pleasure. Thank you very much.